Depending upon where you are in the world today, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Jay Maracus, and I'm the CEO of M Group based out of New York. We are the IR advisors for Benetech. On today's call, you will hear from Dr. Bernard Bray, who will provide you an overview of OPMD. Dr. Bray is a professor of neurology and genetics, co-director of Rare Neurological Diseases Group at Montreal Neurological Institute, McGill University. To note, Dr. Bray is on Benetech's clinical advisory board and is not receiving any funds for his involvement in this webinar. We will then hear from the Benetech team of Dr. David Suey and Georgina Kilfoyle, who will provide a briefing on the unmet medical need of OPMD, Benetech's OPMD therapeutic, and the planned clinical program. Our speakers will then take questions, which you can submit during the webinar online through GoToWebinar. I will read the disclaimer statement and then hand over to Greg West, Benetech CEO, who will provide a corporate overview. If we make any forward-looking statements, we note that such statements involve risks and uncertainties related to the difficulties in our plans to develop and commercialize our product candidates, the timing of the initiation and completion of preclinical and clinical trials, the timing of patient enrollment and dosing of clinical trials, the timing of expected regulatory filings, the clinical utility and potential attributes and benefits of EDR and AI and our product candidates, potential future out licensees and collaborations, our intellectual property position and the ability to procure additional sources of financing. Well, thank you, Jay, and thank you for attending our webinar today relating to our orphan disease program, Inocular Pharyngeal and Muscular Dystrophy, or OPMD. I will give an overview and then hand over to Dr. Bernard Bray. As you know, Benetech is focused on building a broad scientific pipeline of innovative therapeutics by harnessing the power of our DNA-directed RNA interference technology known as DDRNAI. This unique platform technology combines gene therapy and gene silencing to change the treatment paradigms of human disease. We are translating our science into measurable clinical outcomes, which, if successful in the clinic, will have the potential to provide novel treatment options and hope to patients suffering from disease, as well as provide significant shareholder value for Benetech. We anticipate the two of our lead assets will be in the clinic in quarter two, 2018, in quarter one, 2019. Specifically, our lead oncology asset will be entering a phase two clinical trial this month. In addition, we anticipate having our unique science and replace therapeutic designed to treat the orphan disease, OPMD, entering the clinic early 2019. And we have other programs targeting retinal disorders and infectious disease. Benetech is dual listed and trades on both the NASDAQ under the ticker BNTC and on the Australian Stock Exchange under BLT. Our fundraising focus since 2014 has been in the US markets, and we've raised over $50 million. We also have a shelf registration. We have strong in-house capability with our operations both in Sydney and in Haywood, California, where we have our laboratories. The Haywood Laboratory includes nine scientific staff who have PhDs with deep gene therapy expertise. In addition, we have a dedicated group of scientists working on process optimization and scalability for manufacturing. I will now hand over to Dr. Bernard Bray, who will provide an overview of OPMD. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to present to you uh, today some information about oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, a disease very close to my heart, uh, having a uh, worked on this condition for close to 30 years now and following hundreds of patients. What I will discuss to you is uh, today is uh, the prevalence of OPMD worldwide, uh, its diagnosis, uh, the progression and treatment of OPMD, and discuss the end of life uh, with this condition. OPMD is a disease that has a worldwide distribution. It's a late onset muscular dystrophy. Uh, the prevalence is variable from one country to another. There's, in other words, there's more some some countries where there's more cases, some less. Uh, in, in France and Europe in general, it's considered that there's about one case per 100,000 people. In some part of the United States, particularly the Southwest, it's estimated to be one in 15,000 people. In Quebec, uh, where I live, uh, it's one in a thousand, so it's a rare, it's a more common disease because of the founder effect. The OPMD was first described really well in 1915 in a French Canadian population family uh, from Maine. It's really in 1962 that Victor and Adams uh, out of Harvard described the, really the disease and its mode of transmission. Uh, it is, they said it's 
to describe that it was a dominant disease, therefore transmitted from an affected parent to half of uh, his or her siblings. The, um, they described the uh, cardinal manifestation, which is the uh, eyelid drooping and the swallowing difficulty, which is referred to as dysphagia. They uh, also described the uh, weakness uh, that is uh, present in some patients, particularly at the level of the leg muscle, though they didn't dwell on the symptom as much as they could have. In 1980, there was a pathological marker identified for this disease, so therefore it was a muscular dystrophy that you could really confirm pathologically. The advent of uh, better means to find genes in the 90s uh, allowed the uh, identification where the gene was and later publication by our group of the first mutations in this gene in 1980. 1998. Uh, the gene is now referred to as PAP-PN1. The error consists of uh, an expansion of uh, uh, what we call a triplet of nucleotide coding for an alanine, uh, alanine uh, amino acid, which we f is probably responsible for the aggregation of the protein and its dysfunction in the cell. Uh, the test is offered worldwide, so the confirmation of the diagnosis is uh, quite easy. There's different sizes of mutation, and that may affect the severity. We also discovered that some patients don't have a family history because they receive a very small mutation from both parents and therefore have a recessive form of the disease. So let us discuss the major symptom of OPMD, which is the dysphagia, the swallowing difficulty. As we show on the slides, uh, that represents two large group of patients, one from Quebec and one from Uruguay. The, uh, it's around the age of 55 that 50% of the patients have clear dysphagia, swallowing difficulties, uh, and, uh, and that can be uh, made objective by a simple test, which is the test of a swallowing test of a cup of cold, ice cold water. The symptoms, this being said, tend to start in the late 40s and become more and more prevalent. Because uh, the, of the severity, uh, this becomes the most uh, challenging and, and disturbing symptoms for the patients. Furthermore, as people age, because of this problem of uh, swallowing, some food and, and, and liquids may go to the lungs and people develop aspiration pneumonia, which can lead to death if not treated early and certainly uh, lead to a burden of disease that is increased with age. The dysphagia can be uh, treated. Uh, we, it's, people are treated when they have moderate to severe dysphagia. Uh, the uh, traditional therapy was a surgery, which is called cricopharyngeal muscular dis uh, dilatation. Uh, this, in fact, is, is, is now becoming the more standard method, which is a dilatation at the level of the sphincter. Um, though the uh, published evidence is, uh, show, suggests that it's more a short-lived effect, and therefore uh, a lot of patients have to return to the procedure. The risks are small, so it's a valuable procedure, but it, the dysphagia will always return. The more traditional uh, therapy was cricopharyngeal myotomy, so it's a surgery, general anesthesia, complications. It's less popular. It has, it has led to great benefit in some patients, so it's still something that should be contemplated. However, uh, it's, a it's a surgery that needs to be done using certain protocols to uh, be efficacious because if poorly made, people can be even worse afterwards. Uh, the tr use of Botox is still controversial, and there's no good evidence that it's, uh, uh, it's a proven method of treatment for this condition. The eyelid ptosis is, like the dysphagia, something that is really becomes more than 50% of the patients around the age of 50. It's, uh, the burden of disease on patients is less important because they are, there is very good surgery now, and therefore it's one of the manifestations of this dystrophy that can be uh, pretty well treated. The, uh, depending on symptoms, uh, the timing of the surgery uh, varies. Uh, usually, people are not operated until the uh, eyelid covers 50% of the pupil, or if they have uh, symptoms uh, which consist of uh, difficulty at night, uh, cervical pain, which is a common feature of people tilting their head to the back to try to look under uh, the eyelid. The, there are two uh, surgeries. Uh, one is, uh, is a resection of the tendon. It's not permanent and, and is losing favor. Uh, the uh, surgery that people do now is a considered permanent surgery. It's called frontal suspension, and it, uh, it consists of, of using a suture and bringing um, the 
uh, as suspenders that the, the, the wire to the uh, muscle of the forehead and using the muscle of the forehead, which is not affected in disease, to open the eyes, as you see on this picture. The uh, more and more uh, symptomatic uh, preoccupation of patients as they age is the progression of the leg weakness. It appears really uh, early, but probably on average 10 years later than the dysphagia. And in patients with the more standard presentation, it starts having, people start having major complaints related to it, mostly in their late 60s. However, some people have more severe form and may start to complain about the weakness in their 50s, and that the impact uh, is that stairs are become, become more difficult and at one point become impossible. Some people will develop weakness in the upper extremities, again, proximal muscle, difficulty taking things on high shelf, and, and so forth. But overall, uh, it, it it's the leg weakness that's the major problem with very rare loss of walking, though some people will use uh, um, wheelchairs and so forth, though it's rare for longer um, uh, um, distances, and driving is usually uh, preserved. How does uh, people, uh, how do people uh, live with this disease uh, as they progress as the burden increases, the dysphagia increases, there's social withdrawal, and, uh, and though the, uh, there's no, the data on life expectancy is variable, is not as good as we would like, life expectancy is probably uh, close to normal as long as we treat uh, the pneumonias very well uh, and, and, and early. But clearly the patients uh, have a harder life uh, post-retirement and, uh, and uh, the quality of life uh, is, is moderate to poor depending on the severity of, of the disease. So I, I hope I summarize uh, uh, the, what we know uh, on the disease and the impact on the, its clinical evolutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bray. Good morning, everyone. I'm Georgina Kelfoyle. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Benetech. I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss the unmet medical needs that exist in OPMD. As will be described by David in more detail shortly, OPMD is a slow-progressing muscle-wasting disease caused by a defect in the PAD-PN1 gene. Unlike many types of muscular dystrophy, the onset of this disease occurs later in life, typically manif manifesting initial signs in the patient's 40s or 50s and becoming a serious health issue as the disease continues to progress. A critical factor to note is that this type of disease is considered autosomal dominant. This means that the disease can arise in a genetic inheritance pattern in which only one of the two genes that you get from your parents has the mutation. Why this is critical is that these patients do not, do, do not tend to show symptoms of the disease until they are in their later years, and thus already likely to have had children as a result. Of their children, there is a 50-50 chance that their sons or daughters will also have this disease. As far as treatment options, the methods used to provide relief do not address underlying progressive muscle weakness and provide only temporary benefits. Patients must therefore rely on adaptive strategies. Benetech is developing BB301 as a therapeutic to treat the dysphagia associated with OPMD. The data presented here is primary market research data that explores the OPMD patient pathway, treatment trends, factors driving current and future treatment choices, and the unmet medical need. The disease symptoms of OPMD vary depending on severity, rate of progression, and pathophysiology. The common symptoms include ptosis, dysphagia, and leg weakness. The specialty that patients see at initial presentation depends on the triggering symptom. Most often, this is the ptosis or the difficulty swallowing. In a lot of cases, the patient will see their primary care physician and be referred from there. It may also be the ophthalmologist because of the ptosis, or a gastroenterologist because of the swallowing issues. Patients move through the referral pathway to a specialist. The ultimate diagnosis of OPMD is most often done by a neurologist through clinical history, instrumental assessment, and final confirmation through genetic assessment. Looking briefly at the three most common symptoms associated with OPMD, we can see that dysphagia is the most serious clinical feature of this disease. Although ptosis is a key symptom that motivates the patient to seek care, either through their primary care physician or an ophthalmologist, 
This condition can be fixed through corrective surgery, such as a frontal slay. Proximal limb weakness is often not the presenting or first symptom. Although proximal limb weakness is typically not life-threatening, it ultimately impacts patients' quality of life and their ability to do activities of daily living. Yet, from an ability of the patient to thrive, the presence and severity of the dysphagia is much more life-threatening than the other two. Patients have a daily fear of choking to death, and it is the inability to swallow and or restrict food intake into the stomach versus being aspirated into the airways that causes the majority of serious health problems for these patients. As the disease progresses, the incidences of hospitalizations due to aspiration and the seriousness of the resultant lung infections significantly decrease quality of life and can be life-threatening. In addition, malnutrition also factors into the equation. Because of the complexity of the issue, dysphagia associated with OPMD is typically managed by a multidisciplinary team, which is often led by the neurologist and can include gastroenterologists, speech pathologists, dietitians, and otolaryngologists. If we look at the current interventions available, we see there is a lot of room for improvement. There is no cure for the dysphagia, and current treatment options are all palliative in nature. At the top of the pyramid, cricopharyngeal myotomy is considered somewhat effective, though in most cases, full restoration of swallowing does not occur. Even then, scarring from the surgical incision is likely to occur, which reduces the efficacy of the treatment over time. And nothing in the procedure has been done to treat the underlying basis of the disease, which is caused by genetic changes. As with the myotomy, the remaining procedures noted here provide only partial restoration of swallowing function, and importantly, only transient symptomatic benefit. There is nothing on this list that specifically addresses the progressive muscle weakness. As the disease progresses, more invasive treatment options are chosen. It is also important to note that not only is there no standard of care, there is also local and global variations to treatment approaches that exist. Cricopharyngeal myotomy that is offered as a treatment option in Quebec, for example, is rarely provided as a treatment option in New Mexico. I will now pass over to David Suey, who will provide some background on BB301. Thanks, Georgina. On slide 24, we have uh, a diagram uh, which outlines some of the issues associated with aspiration from dysphagia. Both Dr. Bray and Georgina had alluded to dysphagia as being one of the key health issues associated with patients that have OPMD. I thought it was important to further define dysphagia because an understanding of the symptoms helps uh, define the direction that we decide to take in the development program of BB301. On the left-hand side of this panel gives you an idea of the muscles involved in the swallowing process. And understand that swallowing is a coordinated process that starts at the back of the tongue, utilizes the muscles that go along the back of the throat, leading to an area called the cricopharyngeus muscle as outlined in the bottom red box. The cricopharyngeus muscle is really critical as it is the regulator of being able to shuttle food down the esophagus, which ultimately leads to the stomach, and prevents food from going into the trachea, which is an entry point into the lungs. Obviously, food and uh, digestive material going down into the lungs has the capability of leading to aspiration and the types of pneumonia associated with that process. On the right-hand side of the panel, we see a video fluoroscopy of the swallowing process and will illustrate some of the critical issues associated with cricopharyngeal weakness and the muscles in the pharynx in general to be able to swallow. Through the second panel, you can see the bolus of food is starting to be forced its way down the neck where the pharyngeal muscles really act to propel that bolus of food towards the uh, esophagus of the patient. In panel three, what you can see is, is that the bolus of food then starts to uh, gather at a critical point where the cricopharyngeus muscle regulates entry into the esophagus, which is noted by a blue oval at the bottom of that slide. 
However, in patients that have OPMD, most often the muscle strength required to force that food into the esophagus past the cricopharyngeus muscle is often too weak to be able to do that efficiently. And what happens is, is you have a buildup uh, just above the cricopharyngeus muscle, ultimately leading to leakage into the trachea and ultimately into the lungs, which can cause the aspiration and ultimately the problems associated with OPMD. Here we look at the tissue and molecular aspects of OPMD. On the right-hand side of the panel, you can see two muscles taken from the same OPMD patient, whereas the one on the left comes from an impacted or affected area within the patient versus a non-affected or relatively less infected muscle group from the same patient. And the differences are quite obvious. In the affected or OPMD uh, ravaged muscle, you can see a significant decrease in the muscle fiber number, a variation in the size of the muscle fibers, and ultimately fibrosis surrounding those muscles. The net effect of this, of course, is a decrease in muscle force. As Dr. Brea alluded to earlier, there is a genetic basis for this disease, and it is within a protein called poly A binding protein N1. And this is a ubiquitous factor, or what we would typically call a housekeeping gene, that promotes interaction between the poly A polymerase and some of the proteins uh, leading to uh, stabilization of mRNA poly A tails. As Dr. Bray also alluded to, this is an expansion disease, meaning that in these particular cases, there is additional alanine mutations that occur within the PABPN1 gene. Because the protein is unable to fold correctly, it typically forms uh, intranuclear inclusions or clusters of proteins that ultimately can lead to fibrosis and destruction of muscle strength. So because there is a genetic basis of this disease and an inappropriate expression of a disease-causing gene leads to this mutant phenotype and the, the disease-causing phenotype, there is a way to be able to treat or potentially treat this type of disease with an RNA interference-based approach. On the left-hand side of this panel, we see uh, the RNAi process where typically in siRNA-based strategies, you can add presynthesized duplex RNA that once it gets inside the cell, enters the risk complex, finds the appropriate target mRNA, leading to a cleavage event. Because that mRNA is cleaved, no further protein is produced from that particular gene, and essentially you have silenced the gene. So an siRNA approach, this typically needs to be readministered as often as two to three weeks uh, to be able to maintain uh, therapeutic benefit for extended periods of time. Benetech technology is a little bit different. We don't deliver pre-synthesized RNA duplexes. Instead, we typically deliver DNA plasmids or uh, some form of DNA that once it gets inside of the cell, it uses the cell's own transcriptional machinery to produce steady state levels of something called short hairpin RNA, that once it's exported into the nucleus and that hairpin structure is cleaved at that bulbous end, the two pathways are virtually indistinguishable. A couple of really key differences here, particularly when you use gene therapy vectors. A one-time administration can often last uh, months, years, or even potentially the lifetime of the patient. So as long as those cells are healthy, they will continuously be reprogrammed to produce their own therapeutic RNAs uh, to be able to have an impact on the disease. Second, we use steady state levels of transcription to be able to maintain constant RNA therapeutic activity against the desired target. And lastly, because we are using gene therapy vectors, it allows us to have other forms of therapeutic modalities in addition to RNAi. In this case, we are using the excess vector capacity of AAV to be able to express a normal form of the same gene. So in this case, essentially what we're talking about is having the ability to use the RNAi component to knock down the mutant allele of OPMP 
in, in the same vector, same therapeutic vector, expressing a normal, healthy, wild-type copy to essentially restore function. On slide 27 outlines the design of the molecular construct of BB301, and this is really where the, the ingenuity is in this vector. It's a single AAV vector that uses a single muscle-specific promoter to drive what we call a bifunctional RNA. And then bifunctional RNA, what that means is there's two therapeutic modalities coming off of the same piece of genetic material. At the three prime, or the right-hand side of that RNA, we produce the shRNA to be able to silence the mutant disease allele of PABPN1 that leads to OPNV. However, because it's one difficult to uh, develop a shRNA that only selectively inhibits the mutant allele, but two, because we also need to replace the function of that activity, uh, we utilize a codon-optimized form of the PABPN1 gene to essentially restore function. So what we like to call is a silence, as represented by the shRNA, and replace-based approach to be able to do this. In terms of therapeutic vectors, Benetech technology is one of the few technologies that have the ability to do this within a single vector. And that's because the RNAi machinery is already present within the cells, ready to understand how to utilize those shRNAs and silence the gene. And then oftentimes there's packaging capacity left over to express the, uh, a protein in this case, the codon-optimized wild type PABPM1 to restore function. So how does gene therapy work in general is shown on the next slide in slide 28, where we have a virus particle which is typically comprised of a protein shell, and the protein shell dictates which tissues uh, that construct is delivered to. And typically viruses have nucleic acids which help reproduce the virus. So in gene therapy, and particularly how we do it with BB301, we use methods to produce the virus proteins without producing the viral genes inside. Instead, we eliminate those virus genes and we design genetic sequences that can insert it into that protein shell that contain that BB301 cassette that we discussed on the last slide. A manufacturing process is used to insert the BB301 genes into the protein shell, and once completed, BB301 is intended to be injected directly into the muscles impacted in this phasia process, and specifically we're talking about the cricopharyngeal muscle. Once BB301 enters into those muscle cells, it starts producing the genes and genetic material that may help uh, alleviate some of these symptoms. To utilize the vector or which specific viral vector we're using, we are using a vector called adeno-associated virus in which we strip out the virus genes and put in BB301. Some of the specifics with AAB is, is that largely it is non-integrating and non-pathogenic uh, virus in terms of delivery. To date, it's been used in over 200 clinical trials. And we know through several clinical studies as well as multitudes of preclinical data that you can have sustained expression for years uh, following a single injection and potentially up to the lifetime of the, the patient. So how do we test these types of vectors and, and how do we ensure that, uh, at least from a preclinical sense, that these vectors will have activity? In slide 29, this really dictates the animal model that we use to test BB301, and it's a mouse model called the A17 mouse. Just as the expanded or alanine expanded PABPN1 gene causes disease in human beings, we knock in a copy of bovine PABPN1 in which uh, multiple alanines have been expanded into the protein and we set that up within the mouse system in what's called a transgenic mouse. When it does this, and when we produce these offspring and these mice, uh, they mimic many of the disease pathologies associated with OPMD, including severe muscle atrophy. So below I will show you a few types of data we'll be looking at as we go through uh, this section. On the far left, you see intranuclear inclusions in normal muscle tissue. You typically don't have these clusters of protein that form these clumps. 
In the A17 model, you can see these green punctate staining bodies, which are indicative of these protein clumps. As I told you before, oftentimes there's fibrosis associated with uh, OPMD, and in the A17 mouse, we see a reproduction of the enhanced fibrosis in that bottom panel as compared to the normal animal on top. Because OPMD is a disease of muscle force, uh, one of the key parameters for us to look at is the ability or how much force each of these muscles can exert uh, before and after treatment with BB301. And what you can see in this panel is that the A17 diseased mouse has significantly less muscle force over the frequencies uh, tested uh, in the stimulation model uh, versus the red line, which represents the normal animals. And lastly, because we all know that when you don't use your muscles, they tend to shrink, assessing muscle weight or atrophy is a key parameter as well. And you can see in the last panel on the right that the A17 mouse has significantly reduced muscle weight relative to overall body weight uh, versus the normal mouse. So how are we going to deliver BB301 in a clinical setting? We're going to do this by direct intramuscular injection. And the question is, is whether or not by injecting AAV-based vectors, can it transduce or can it treat the muscles that we're injecting into? In slide 30, what we've done is, is we've inserted a gene called green fluorescent protein into the AAV-9-based vector that we're utilizing for BB301. And as you can see on the bottom of the left-hand panel, that when we inject this vector into the leg or TA muscles of the mice, you have this bright fluorescence glowing, indicative that we've been able to treat those specific muscles. On the right-hand side of the panel is a mouse that has been injected for over a year with this GFP-containing uh, protein, and you can see that even after a year, the muscles are still quite bright, quite green, and when you look specifically at a cellular level or a muscle level, you can see that most, if not all, of those muscle fibers have been treated. So the real question is, is how do we know it's efficacious? And on slide 34, next slide please, gives you an idea of how we've tested this. Previously, we've shown some data in which we have had a single vector system of BB301 introduced at two doses. In this newest experiment, we broadened out significantly the range of doses uh, across uh, the entire group of animals that we were working with. And the idea is to get an idea if there's a dose response in relation to how much of the BB301 compound we introduce. And so the range is significantly broader, ranging from 48 vector genomes per muscle up to roughly uh, uh, three logs higher at 7.5 E11 vector genomes per muscle. Each of the animals were dosed in each leg. And so out of a total of five animals, we're looking at roughly 10 muscles. And these were animals that already had the OPMD uh, effect established within them. So we're not necessarily preventing OPMD, or OPMD and its phenotypes. We're correcting OPMD and its phenotypes. The endpoint parameters were monitored over 14 weeks, and we looked at some of the parameters that we mentioned previously. So in slide 32, we look at the levels of shRNA produced from BB301, starting at the lowest doses at the far right. We can see that at 48, really, there's not a significant level of shRNA that's being produced from that level of dose. Yet when we go to the next highest dose at 2E9 vector genomes per muscle, we're now producing on the order of roughly 2,500 copies of each of the shRNAs. By the time we go to the next two doses, we're now producing shRNAs in the tens of thousands. And by the time we get to the 2.5E11 vector genome muscle group, we're producing hundreds of thousands of copies of these therapeutic RNAs per cell. And finally, at the top level, we're producing millions of copies of each of the shRNA. So very clearly, as we increase the dose, we have the ability to increase the potential therapeutic capacity by simply increasing the number of shRNAs. On slide 33, we look at 
the impact of those SHRNAs on PADPN1 expression within those muscles. And again, at the lowest doses, you're really not having a significant impact at inhibiting that mutant PABPN1, but certainly as we increase the dose moving from right to left, by the time we get to 2.5E11 and 7.5E11 vector genomes per muscle, we're now having 75% inhibition and 86% inhibition of mutant PABPN1, respectively. So the next question is, is what happens to the levels of codon-optimized protein expression? In slide 34, we see uh, measurements of codon-optimized PABPN1 expression. So this is the replacement protein. Again, at the lowest levels, we're not seeing a significant level of PABPN1 expression occurring, but certainly by the mid-range doses of 1E10 and 5E10 vector genomes per muscle, we start producing the protein after 14 weeks. And certainly at the two highest doses, we're now replacing the normal level of the protein by 26 and 63% respectively. And again, to be clear, this is a single vector silence and replace based system. We silence the bad causing genes and we essentially replace them with healthy, normal copies. On slide 35, we're going to look at intranuclear inclusions, those green spots that we talked about uh, a couple of slides back. On the bottom, you can see again the A17 mouse versus the wild type saline mice. In the disease model, you see these punctate bodies. As you now dose the animal, uh, starting at the lowest doses and as the boxes pop up, we're going to uh, higher doses. You can see a significant and drastic reduction in the amount of punctate bodies. So the key thing here is, is this is not only disease halting, this is reversing the course of the disease. So the preclinical evidence that we have is that this is a disease-modifying type of compound that's being applied in this therapeutic situation. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a graphical representation of the same data from those slides on the right. And you can see that as the A17 uh, mice, which have roughly 35% of the cells, uh, that have these green punctate bodies, uh, certainly by the time you get to 2.5 E11 or 7.5 E11, we've all but abrogated uh, the production of these intranuclear inclusions. On slide 36, we see that uh, measure, uh, measurement of muscle forces associated with the A17 model. And again, just to be clear, OPMD is a disease in which muscle function is negatively impacted, specifically on muscle force. On this first panel to the left, you can see the black line. These are the A17 mouse versus the red line, which are the wild type or FVB mouse. As we have low doses introduced into these animals at 4E8, 2E9, or 1E10 vector genomes per muscle group, we see a slight modification and a slight improvement in muscle force, but nothing really significant as of yet. When we move to a dose of 5E10 vector genomes per muscle, you can now see a restoration of muscle force, approximately regaining roughly half of the specific muscle force. And now at the two highest doses administered to these animals, you can see that we are now near wild-type levels. So we have essentially restored muscle strength. When you compare this against the indexes for silence and replacing these proteins, you can see that the doses of 5D10 or higher have levels that extend anywhere from 31% inhibition uh, up to 86% inhibition, and really minimal levels of codon-optimized expression start reversing that phenotype. What this suggests to us, at least in this preclinical setting, is, is that there's a potential for a broad therapeutic range of BB301 that, when applied to these muscles, may have an impact on being able to correct this mutant disease phenotype. On slide 40, we just look at, specifically on the right-hand side of this panel, whether or not we, by restoring muscle function, we also restore muscle weight. Again, if you don't use your muscles, they tend to shrink. Overall, weight of those muscles goes down. So the left-hand side of the panel is the exact same graph from the last uh, uh, 
panel that we saw, and we can see that the brown, purple, and light blue groups correlate with minimal increases in muscle function. And likewise, in muscle weight on the right-hand graph, we see that there's a slight increase over the A17 background. But as we move into doses of 5B10 and higher, you can now see that the corresponding muscle force that we see on the left-hand side of this panel corresponds with restoration of muscle weight. And again, this is a really great confirmatory uh, set of data that suggests that by restoring muscle function, you're essentially reversing the phenotype and really trying to reset the muscle back to a wild-type condition. So how quickly does this process occur? So what we see on the left-hand side of the panel in slide 37 is two doses of BB301 going into these animals. And again, the black line is the diseased animal, and the red line represents the wild-type mouse. The green and blue lines show slight improvement by week 14 post a single administration. And we look at week 20 on the right-hand side of the panel, you can see that those two lines move closer to the wild-type level. So again, it's not an instantaneous effect, but it occurs over several weeks uh, as BB301 has the ability to restore function to these muscles. And ultimately, when you look at the levels of inhibition and wild type expression, you can see at the highest dose, we've now essentially silenced 90 or 88 percent of the mutant PAP1 uh, gene, and at the same 20-week time point, we've restored it by 91%. So we've knocked out 90% of the good, or 90% of the bad, excuse me, and replaced it with 90% of good, healthy, normal gene expression. So where are we going with this program and what are the next steps? As uh, Georgina will discuss shortly, we've had several interactions with regulatory agencies and really the next step in any clinical development pathway is to show safety of these compounds before you initiate a human clinical trial. We have uh, decided to perform our safety studies in sheep, and the reason why we decided to do this is the animals are approximately the same weight. The muscles that are being injected into are approximately the same size as human beings. And so on the top left panel is an uh, idea of one of these sheep. On the top right panel is an image of the cricopharyngeus muscle as taken by an endoscopy examination of one of these animals. And the white dotted line is now circling specifically the cricopharyngeus muscle. It's a very well-defined structure that we'll be able to dose. And finally, on the bottom of this slide shows you the endoscopy-based instrument that helps guide the surgeon to be able to uh, direct the injection of BB301 directly into those muscles. Lastly, to support any human clinical study and through towards any sort of clinical development pathway, you need to have, be, have the ability to produce the drug. And on B slide 39, we talked about the scalable manufacturing process of BB301. For BB301 specifically, we produce this material in a baculovirus-based methodology system that allows this process to be very scalable. You can produce material anywhere from as little as 30 milliliters up to several hundred or even a thousand liters ultimately. By having a scalable procedure allows you to control the cost of goods ultimately and how much of the material you can produce in a cost-efficient manner. We're using a modified AAB9 based capsid for the generation of highly active BB301 uh, particles. We already have yields that are in excess of 1E14 vector genomes per liter, which is excellent for this type of process. And the recovery yields in the final product range from 30 to 40 percent. We're producing the GMP clinical grade material at a leading contract manufacturing organization, and we've actually already produced this uh, material very efficiently at a 50 liter scale, and over the summer we'll be producing this specific clinical product at the 250 liter scale. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview of the advances we've made within the science. I will now turn it back over to G Georgina Kilfoyle uh, to describe the clinical aspects of this compound. Thank you, David. Any drug development process must proceed through 
several stages in order to produce a product that is safe, efficacious, and has passed all regulatory requirements. On this slide, we look back at where BB301 has come from and its path moving forward to the clinic. Once the target has been discovered, in this case, the PAB-PN1 gene, early preclinical work focuses on looking primarily at efficacy. That is whether it works both in vitro and in vivo. In the case of BB301, initial work was done with a dual vector. This is where the silence and replace are given at the same time but as separate components. Based on the results seen, Benetech focused efforts on developing BB301, which is the current single vector that David described. This single vector greatly simplifies the manufacturing and regulatory process for future development. Manufacturing process development work is conducted in parallel to these preclinical studies. This is to ensure a process is developed to make BB301 that is both reproducible and scalable. Once we have a product that is efficacious in an animal model and we have the basis of a manufacturing process, we then move into what we call IND enabling work. It is important, especially for gene therapy products and for a novel silence and replace approach, that these IND enabling studies are discussed and agreed with the regulatory agencies. This improves the likelihood that BB301 will pass all the regulatory requirements to enter the clinic. With this in mind, we met and discussed our plans for BB301 with the regulatory agencies in key OPMD countries, such as the US, Canada, and France. There are three main parts to the IND enabling work. Firstly, the definitive toxicology studies that establish the safety characteristics of BB301. Here, the FDA or other regulatory agencies want to understand the safety signals seen from doses that are higher than the expected clinical dose. The first of these studies, as David described, is underway for BB301. Secondly, the scale-up of manufacturing to provide material to support the toxicology studies, the GLP manufacturing, and material that will be used in the clinic, GMP manufacturing. GLP manufacturing for BB301 has been completed at a 50-litre scale, and we are now moving into the GMP manufacturing at a 250-litre scale, which will produce enough high-quality material to support the first clinical study. Lastly is the development of the clinical protocol. For BB301, we have spent much of the last six to nine months working closely with key opinion leaders to design the first clinical study. These are individuals that either treat patients with OPMD or are experts in understanding the swallowing function. We feel we are well positioned now to progress BB301 into the clinic. The pathway has been set, and it is now just the time it takes to complete the required toxicology and manufacturing work to support a high-quality regulatory filing. I would like to provide you with a brief overview of the planned Phase 1-2A study with BB301. Because BB301 is a gene therapy, the first clinical study is in patients, which means that while the primary goal of the study is safety and tolerability, we can also look for signs of clinical activity. Keep in mind that as you view this, it reflects our current thinking, and it is possible that the design may change. We are meeting with our key opinion leaders in person this week to discuss and further define the study design. In addition, the study design parameters are subject to change based on non-clinical toxicology results and regulatory feedback. As currently written, the study will be in patients clinically and genetically diagnosed with OPND who have an impairment in swallowing function. Patients will receive a single intramuscular dose of BB301 into the cricopharyngeal muscle in the throat. This clinical protocol is designed as a dose escalation study, so we enroll patients at increasing doses with a time period between each cohort to ensure it is safe before we proceed to the next dose. Once we receive the top, reach the top dose or define a dose that is maximally effective, we will enroll an additional number of patients. All patients on this study who receive BB301 will be followed for a year. The primary endpoint is safety and tolerability. However, because these are patients, we will also be looking at quantitative clinical improvement in swallowing, as well as patient-reported improvements in swallowing and quality of life. So as described in the slides above, we have a clear unmet medical need and a therapeutic in BB301 
which has the potential from a single intramuscular administration to restore muscle strength and improve the symptoms of dysphagia. This would support the potential for early adoption and high market penetration of BB301 if it is approved. Additional factors that may also contribute to the potential market are the possible orphan drug exclusivity, which we might gain under the orphan drug designations we have in both the US and EU, an increasing diagnosis of OPMD due to the aging population and an increased awareness of OPMD, and lastly, life cycle expansion opportunities for BB301 that we can consider once we have initial signs of clinical proof of concept. These include expansion of the intramuscular administration into earlier stages of dysphagia before tissue damage has been detected, the potential for developing a formulation of BB301 that can be given systemically so it treats the proximal muscle weakness and ptosis as well as the dysphagia, and finally, the use of BB301 as a prophylactic for preventing the symptoms of OPMD. On that pass back to Greg West. Thank you. Next slide, please. As you can see today, we are well advanced from a scientific and clinical perspective to achieve our plan to be in the clinic in early 2019 in our OPMD program. But a tech's long-term objective is to become the leader in discovering, developing, clinically validating and commercialising DDRNAI-based therapeutics for a range of human diseases with high unmet clinical need and, as a result, provide a better life for patients with these diseases. We believe that the initiation of our clinical studies will be the major catalyst for value creation in 2018 and 2019. These milestones speak to our strategy of becoming a multi-product clinical stage company and represent an opportunity for significant shareholder value. I'll now hand over to Jay for questions. Thank you for uh, the presentation, guys. Um, we only have a few minutes left here, and we have a bunch of questions in the queue, so I want to get right to it and ask some questions. Um, first, what will it take to get this to market? Uh, Georgina, um, this is really uh, uh, for you. Sure, happy to take that. Um, I can describe our thinking at this time, which is uh, pretty reflective of the discussions we've had with regulatory agencies. Um, BB301 being a gene therapy product and being an orphan product uh, for which, for a disease where there isn't a current treatment, we wouldn't anticipate that it'll go through a standard process of phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, what we have been talking to the FDA and other regulatory agencies about is that um, assuming no safety signals seen in the first study and that we do see pretty good indications of clinical efficacy, that we would move straight from the phase 1, 2A study into a single small um, phase 3 study to support approval. Um, obviously, if, if we saw something untoward or we don't find an effective dose, we may need to do more studies. And... Um, Likewise, if we see really good efficacy, we may have discussions with the regulatory agencies about progressing even faster towards the market. So at the end of the day, it's really going to depend on the outcomes from that first study. Um, we are working um, to design that first clinical study in such a way that um, it will maximize our opportunities for success and give us the fastest path forward to approval. That's great. Thank you, Georgina. Um, we've got another question here, and I'm just going to fire them away. You talk about silence and replace approach in other areas. Can you expand on this? David, that's really uh, up your alley. Uh, over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Greg, and, and great question. So, yeah, again, just to reiterate, you know, one of the key points from this, this talk is, is that what we talk about with BB301 is that because we use endogenous cellular machinery for the SHRNA and it's already present and it's, it's programmed and ready to go and, and the short RNA that we're adding uh, have the ability to knock down disease phenotypes, um, that it leaves a lot of vector packaging capacity left over to express other things like normal genes. So really the, the, the question is, is what other things could we go for? And, and certainly understanding that OPMD is a polyalanine expansion disease, 
where you produce a mutant protein that needs to be knocked down and, and still replace the normal wild type copy. I can see, you know, a, a large number of other similar types of diseases that are poly expansion diseases. In fact, you know, one of the ones that people are working on actively is Huntington's program, where it's a, a poly uh, glutamine type of disease or poly Q disease that has a similar phenotype to produce a, a mutant protein that really loses function. And so at Benetech, you know, obviously this silence and replace in a single vector based system is really unique to what we do and represents a, a great therapeutic niche uh, for the development of other diseases. And we continue to look at uh, similar types of diseases as well as a few others uh, to really be able to apply this technology uh, moving forward. And, and really then that OPMB is, OPMD is just a bellwether in terms of other diseases uh, like that, that we can really move forward with. The next question I have um, is for Dr. Bray. Doctor, how do you think BB301 will fit into your treatment paradigms for your patients? So the, the, as you know from the presentation, this is a revolutionary treatment. The first application to the major symptoms of dysphagia may completely change our way of treating those patients, uh, implying that if we can correct the disease uh, to the extent that the dysphagia disappears, uh, as I insisted in my presentation, we will have very, very happy patients uh, with, and with a lot m less morbidity, probably longer life expectancy, and all the social impact of the disease uh, will change. So I suspect uh, as, as this uh, new uh, therapeutic approach uh, for, for the dysphagia uh, will be introduced, uh, it will change completely our, our treatment paradigm. Thank you, Dr. Bray. The next question I have um, is also for Dr. Bray. What do you think BB301 will need to do to make a difference for patients? I think uh, we hear from patients that the major symptoms I I are related to the dysphagia. So if the treatment is very good uh, for, the, for correcting forever uh, this, uh, this symptom, then I think the, the, what, we, what we're going to hear from patients and, and treating physicians like myself is like, can we apply this technology to more of the body? This is a selective regional dystrophy. So whether this technology will go to a next step and, and be used uh, to address some of the other weakness, a weaker muscle, uh, will be really, I think, at, at the top of our, of our, our preoccupation. Short term, however, uh, the emphasis on the dysphagia will make a huge difference for patients because it's, it's the major symptom for quality of life, healthy living in aging. Uh, so, I, so I suspect this is, is really where the difference uh, will lie. Uh, guys, we really only have time for one last question. I'll ask you right now. What are the clinical endpoints you are talking about? I'm happy to take that one. Um, the clinical endpoints that we're looking at um, are very much quantitative measures of swallowing. We think it's important that these are quantitative to really show the impact that BB301 can have on um, OPND patients. Historically, when you look at dysphagia in OPMD and other diseases, I think the tools have been quite subjective. For example, uh, the water swallow test, which is where patients are given a glass of water and the time it takes them to drink it is measured. Um, that's one of the main ones that's been used. Um, we'll be obviously including this in our assessments, but I think we're going to try and fold in some of the newer, more quantitative measures of swallowing. And this includes things such as video fluoroscopy and high-resolution manometry. Um, the video fluoroscopy, you saw some data on some of David's earlier slides today. It's a real-time x-ray that looks at the ability to swallow safely and effectively. And then the high-resolution manometry um, looks at the pressure during the swallowing, um, and that can be translated into a measure of the efficiency of swallowing. And both of these can be quantitatively measured, making them much more um, objective in nature. And uh, lastly, with respect to the clinical endpoints, um, because the swallowing has such an impact on patients' quality of life, it's very important that we are looking at patient-reported outcomes. Um, so we'll be looking at things such as swallowing-related quality of life and also patient-reported changes in their swallowing function and how much food they're able to uh, take in. That's great. Thank you, Georgina. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. 
Um, I want to thank Benetech, Dr. Bray, everyone who's joined the, the call here today. For those who submitted questions we didn't have time to answer, we will answer every one of those questions, and we will post all of them on our website where we have the, the webinar posted. Thank you all for joining today's OBMD webinar.